Hollywood, you know. Oh, he's crazy. Oh, yeah, but you wanted my story, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, but then you got to get rid of you. You're crazy. All right, I might embarrass you. Right? You, you might embarrass me. You're crazy. I can't have you in there. Who well, knows what you're going to say? You, you know, you're out of control. Right, I'm not a slave like you. <laughs> oh, gosh. But then the same thing happens in the Christian business. Hey, how about the idea that it's not supposed to be a business? How about the idea, you're not supposed to use it to sell your books and your stuff. I'm furthering the gospel. Oh, right. Right, well, that's what they all say. That's why we have so many bookstores. That's why people have so many books and things. Because they're just saving the world for Jesus. They don't need to be 501c3. All they have to do is just, just keep pushing their wares. But, you know, if you, if you look closely, the ones who are successful, they all have ties to the 501c3, every one of them. Do the research. You'll see that old Zeph here, he, he, he told you the truth. Talking about myself in the third person here. I told you the truth. They is all connected to them 501c3 churches. They're like breakaways, you know, but then they have their affiliations back to the fold. It's like they're on a mission to conform you all to the wrong way so that you can then be saved again by Jesus. We want you to take a little fall, a little corruption, and then you can be a sinner like the rest of us, broken on through to the other side, and then you can say, I praise Jesus, like the rest of us do. And so, you know, who do you think you are, anyway, to put yourself above everybody else? You know, it's like, so, so okay, so let me get this straight. And uh, you want me to break on through to the other side, In other words, sell my soul so that I don't put myself above you through pride so that I can then be saved by Jesus like all of you. That's right, Death. Then everything is good. Right, you don't have to worry about anything then. You know, you're just serving the Lord. Yep, we're just serving the Lord. Serving him up. It just <laughs> we we have nothing if not some humor around here, right? See, to me it's okay. Now I gotta deal with suicidal people. Okay. So how many of you are suicidal? I see some hands. Okay. Switching gears here. Well, you know, thank you for indulging me. You know, I'd there had been a breach in my, you know, my experience from the filmmaking thing to today. And then, you know, I got the call from the Lord. And then he had me, you know, um, you know, he put me through all these changes. I became a different person, you know, in a sense. But I'm still the person that, still the same person too, you know, that has to deal with things from the past. So it's all contiguous now. And I thank you for that. Uh, you know, in other words, the traumas, the, <clears throat> the betrayals, the, um, the lying the playing the fool for these people that are liars and sycophants and slaves so they don't have to worry about anything, you know, because I'll be the fool for them. Uh, and then the guilt they're in and all the, all the trouble. At least now we can look at it all and say, okay, it's cool, man, you know. I don't take it personally. I take it as a systemic situation. So, you know, I have, I, I feel concerned for the people that I worked with, the people that I knew growing up, my boyhood friends and all. I see them in their social circles and in their lives today. And I, you know, my heart goes out to them. I hope they're having a decent life. I hope they found the Lord. I hope they found the truth. I don't hold it against them if they mocked me or did something or betrayed me or laughed at me. I understand that, that they, the system had them by the... You know what? And um, they have to. They had to do what they had to do. You know, but boy, that's an evil. I'm just glad I'm not involved. I I wouldn't change a thing, folks. 
I would rather be a victim of them than be a participant with them in, in, the, in that kind of e organized evil. I would rather be, you know, the scapegoat and work my way through it rather than being, you know, the, uh, the, the one who's hiding in the darkness doing all manner of evil. I'd, you know, it, it, with a scapegoat, <clears throat> you can, you can un work your way through it and realize, hey, I don't deserve that. You know what I mean? You can walk away. You can just go, well, that's untrue. I, I've got nothing to do with your thing. And no, I'm not crazy. No, I'm not, you know, to be shamed. No, I haven't done anything wrong. You know, and if I participated in your film and I, and I, you know, was a small part in helping it to be a success that's redounding only to your benefit and you don't want to share that benefit with everyone, that's fine. Go ahead, you know. And I don't hold that against you. I don't hold anything. I don't hold on to anything. I don't want a film career. I don't want to write screenplays. I don't want to make movies. And um, I didn't even then. I was just using the medium of the screenplay to find out the truth. And boy, oh boy, did I get that smacked right upside the head. But I don't blame anyone. I don't blame my mother. I love my mother. And I love my father. And I love my brother. And I love my family. So I've done nothing there either. Sure, we had, you know, we had scrapes that had to do with this problem, this situation. And, you know, people in the world just say, well, just everyone needs to get along to go along and go along to get along and then we'll all do fine. And the people that are, that are not, you know, getting it, they're the problem. And no, they're not the problem. They're the solution. Society has it backwards. But, you know, okay, I, I'm not going to blame society either. I am so excited about this track that's going to drop today that I can't tell you it's about San Bernardino. And uh, San Bernardino, yeah. Oh, it's not what you think. It's called San Bernardino, the promised land. But it's really kind of a joke, and yet it isn't. Uh, you'd have to understand I, I'm a very, very uh, highly skilled artiste. And the, the kind of things I do in the lyrics are things they won't figure out for a hundred years. But, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding, you know. People don't get me, you know. They just go, oh, look, the work of the crazy man. And that's fine, um, you know. Oh, look, the work of a lying pervert. That's your work. At least I'm out here, <laughs> I got no cover. I'm out here in the, you know, in the, in the scalding sun with your rebuke in my face all day long for being what God made me, you know what I mean? So I'm not going to be ashamed of what the Lord made. He didn't make me a piece of garbage. I know you want me to treat myself as garbage, but I'm not going to do it. You meaning, you know, the collective you out there. The you who do not agree with the El Zeph report. The you who would rather see people like me as some kind of, oh, you crazy, you know, like, and you're all normal, I say. Okay, that makes sense. Well, there's no sense fighting it. It's always going to be the same reaction. We, hey, we got it in Christianity, you get it in Hollywood filmmaking, you get it in. You know, if you're different, the cost is they're always going to try to, and if you're vulnerable and if you're not vigilant, they will make you into a scapegoat. So you have to really be careful, you know. There are dangers out there and you need to act with discernment. And that's what I'm telling you. Now, back to the suicidal people. The Lord had this going yesterday and I'm, I'm here to, yes, well, the Lord obviously heard you and I'm addressing it. It's not like we don't know you're there. You know, the back of the TV is lighting up. There's like a light back there. One has to wonder. Oh, that is highly strange. You know. One has to, I'm going to look back there. Hmm. Well, it's some kind of light that's flickering on and off back there. Uh, 
The reason I mention that is because it's behind, I'm sitting in an area where there's a television, <clears throat> and I thought it was, but it's some light, and uh, I, I suppose I'll have to deal with that later. Well, it's weird. I mean, it, 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 it goes on and off intermittently, and uh, it's not the gear like the, the box for the TV or anything. I don't know what it is. But I'll find out. Then I'll let you know. Anyway, suicide. No. I understand you're hurting. I understand. The world looks really bleak like there's no way out. The economy is going off the cliff right now on Obama's watch. So watch for the long knives of impeachment coming out. I told you, the guy's going to go through a fall. <laughs> so are the rest of us. Yes, it's awful out there and we're trying to weather it. But it's just, uh, it's just not a good time. And uh, so I'm trying to, you know, cope with all this. And uh, as well, and I realize there's people out there that are, you know, I, I guess the pain is it's, nothing is going to be like the way it was ever again. And some of us have just decided, okay, that's the way, that's the new paradigm, that's the new reality. Others can't cope with that and they become suicidal, but that's really what it is. Plus, there's at least one of you who've lost a loved one and you keep thinking about crying about losing the loved one and, you know, it goes on and on. So, look, obviously, if that's you, then on your knees, the Lord is speaking to you, at least through me. I mean, look, it got brought up, right? So whatever you're planning, um, don't. We talked about the suicide spells before. It's just the, the, the critters are out manifesting, and a lot of this is witchcraft, and a lot of this is just like they're beaming you with this negative vibes, you know, to, to off yourself. And the thing is, there's no justification. It ends up being an angry thing. It's like, you know, you're, 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 you're killing yourself to punish God for having for your, the misery that you feel that God could have eradicated, but he didn't, so it's his fault, so you're going to kill yourself. You need the Lord, and you need, you know, you're, you need to be intact before the Lord. Look, whatever happens, look, let, let's just cling to the Lord here. Whatever happens outside, you know, whatever happens with the economy or with loved ones, and people come and go, you know, and they die, and then thing, and we just do the best we can, then it comes time for us to die. There's no guarantee here. You know, it's always been a very dangerous place, this world. It's never been Disneyland. It's, see, it's never been the agreed-upon fantasy world that they tried to inculcate us with. It's, it's always been dangerous. And so, look, you know, it's, a, it's an honor, privilege to be here, to be fighting the good fight of faith. There's no, there's no better thing you can do right now in the eyes of God than fight the good fight of faith and prove to the Lord that, you know, you're, you're just going to stand with him no matter what. And we need you to, 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 to hang in there. Even better, we need you to, to really, you know, get into it. Because there is no other alternative. You know, you're just crying with the world's tears. You're in sorrow with the world's sorrow. To let them lament people dying and people, you know. Uh, the Lord wants to make you light as a feather floating around, dancing. You know, the more chaos it's come, the more people in sorrow, the happier you seem to be, the more of a uh, something people might even be jealous of because they want, they want to be lifted out of their doldrums, out of their depression. I mean, right now people are just throwing antidepressants down their throats and everything else, you know, because of the fact that, you know, this American dream just went down the tubes. And so, you, you know, so they are committing suicide, but you're not to do that. You are a witness... You belong to the Lord. Do you, let me ask you a question. Do you belong to the world? Did the world accept you? Or, or were you, you know, the black sheep or the odd man out or whatever? No, you're a lamb. Okay, well then you belong to the Lord. You have no business even going down this road of thought. Anyway, the Lord is ministering to you. The holy angels have prevented you from doing something stupid. And I'm telling you, and I couldn't possibly tell you unless the Lord told me, unless it was all hooked up here. 
completely supernatural. So, um, even the method, where well, you want to use the car and the exhaust fumes, I'm, you, I'm telling you that that's not only no, but that's, that's a big no, and that's not going to happen. You can't do that because you don't have anywhere else to go but the Lord. You, you, you would, you, you, that's the only place you can go, and in doing so, you have to honor life that you've been given as a gift. You cannot selfishly or in anger toward God take, it's an anger toward God. It's not anger toward anyone. It's, you're saying to God, you made junk, and this is awful, and you could have made me have a better life, and you just pissed all over me, so I'm, I'm taking this away from you. And, you know, then that puts you in the realm of a Satanist. And, you know, what, what's the difference? The Satanists have all rejected God. God could have made them a better life, but he didn't. They want to be cool. They don't want to be fools. They want to have, you know, employment opportunities and friends and, you know, social networks and, and uh, private schools for their kids and all that. And, you know, we're not going to, you know, so we got to, right? So we're going to sell our souls to have a better life. That's the dumb thing they do. They've already committed suicide, but, but suicide's not, you're among the living. And no one said this was easy, but I mean, you get to a point where there's so many bad things that happen that you just start laughing. Have you ever had that? You just kind of joyously go along and until they tell you, until the music stops. What good is it worrying about anything? And there's some people that, you know, there, some of you out there are feeling like, I can't pay the bills, I can't do this, there's no opportunity, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and there's always some answer, but you're going to have to calm down. If you were a worlder, down with the world system, down with the whole thing, I could see suicide. You know, it's, I could see people being suicidal there at some point. You know, I mean, it's almost a cliche, the, the Wall Street, uh, you know, people jumping off the buildings on Wall Street during the 29 Depression, you know, uh, we, we the, you know, I understand that. But if you're Lamb of God, you know, you, you just, you, the problem is you don't have much in the way of faith, and you need more faith, but you can't have faith unless you exercise faith. So I'm asking you, I'm saying you've got to hold on, because a blessing is is you're receiving a blessing right now. You just don't recognize it yet, but you will tomorrow. But, you know, so this is, this is intervention. The fact that it's even mentioned should blow your mind and you should be on your face right now and just ask forgiveness because, you know, you're sinning. That's all. Just repent of it and move on. Of course... It might make sense, like I say, for a world, but for, for you it doesn't because you don't have anywhere else to go. You know, the Lord is pretty much your bread and butter and that's it. And you better be nice to the Lord because you've got, that's all you've got. That's all any one of us has. So, you know, no matter how bad it gets, we've got the Lord. We just have to do right by him, you know. And, and if it does get bad, then it's a test. It's a test because it's, he's growing your faith. Okay, fine, let's have our faith grown, but... You know, again, it's just out of, the, out of the question. You can't do it. There is no way that, that it's, it's not going to be perceived as anything um, noble on your part anyway. It's only going to be, be perceived as a negative. And the Lord will not abide in it. So God help you. What happens to you? Don't. You know, throw your own ally, the Lord God that made everything, under the bus. That's essentially the way it would be seen. And I know you don't want to be remembered for being so angry at God you kill yourself. I mean, to the worlders with their tragic lives, I could, you know, they're ennui, and, you know, they're, 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 they're basically their nihilism. Yeah, I can see it. The hemlock society, you know. But that's not your way. You see, because you've already surrendered your life to the Lord. Let him dictate. He dictates your steps. He knows the day of your death. He is the one that you go to for redress of your complaints. 
if I have to be here every day to remind you of this, I will be. But right now I'm reminding you of it because the Lord's telling me, you know, yes, the warfare is ramped up big time. The suicidal thoughts that you have are not your own thoughts anyway. Once again, the suicidal thoughts you're having, and there's more than one, are not your own thoughts anyway. This will pass. But you have to be still. Stop moving around. You know, get into the word. Pray, you know, Psalm 23, or if you Psalm 91, Psalm 16, whatever, Psalm 18. Um, you know, um, by his stripes we are healed and I say all, all of it, all of that applies. Lord is a salve and he will soothe and ease you. He, he's, he's there, but you know, he, he, you need to call on him rather than calling on your own twisted thoughts. You don't belong to the world. You belong to the Lord. You are the property of Yahweh, Yeshua. You're not your own anymore. You weren't. You can't just suddenly decide you're not going to play anymore and because legally you can't do it. You've laid your life down already. You've died to Christ and you're not, there's no going back anywhere. There is no anywhere to go to. So like me, I mean, I could, look, I could cry you a river right now of all the bad things that happened or I can choose to go on joyously in the Lord you know, trusting him and just forgetting about my own thoughts. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, if I wanted something from the world right now and I tried my best and I just kept getting the same tragic result, sure, I'd probably be suicidal too, but I didn't do that. I laid my life down for the Lord. I asked him into my life and it was permanent. And from that day forward, I served him and that's it. And so there isn't, you know, going back to the worldly ways or going back to suicidal thoughts, which is the world again, or going back to, um, you know, pity me, or going back to, um, you know, gee, I'm, they, they mocked me and laughed at me. Boo-hoo, I think I'll cry for 10 years because all my works have been in vain. You know, I mean, I mean I'm not going there. I'm not going to do it. I tell you, I'm not going to do it. Why don't you be inspired by me then? I'm not going to do it. I've got every reason to complain if I wanted to. You know, unfair treatment, Lord, unfair treatment. But see now, I don't care. Yeah, but you brought up that rejection by Dizdard. I did, well, you know, I don't, I just feel, it's just unresolved thing. You know, I feel bad for him, but I, I don't, I, I, I don't want it reversed. I don't care what happened. I don't care what he did. I don't, people do that. I mentioned things that happened. You know, the director on the film, I mentioned, you know, I don't want to get too into it, but I mean, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the idea of this mythologizing me as some kind of crazy person that's writing their fantasies down in, 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 in screenplay format, but thank God the real filmmakers came along to make it into something. Um, you know, th this is just. I don't care. I don't even care if they correct the record or not. And, and right now the record is basically a lie, but I don't care what they do. I don't want their approval, and I certainly don't want to do any... Um, I'm not interested in the things that I wanted before. If I were, I would be suicidal. If I wanted the approval of this film community, I would be probably suicidal. I'd say, I've done everything to get your respect and I've loved you and you've hated me and what gives here? I could do that and cry you a river if, if you want. But I'm not going to because it's not me. You know, whatever, whatever they think of me and whatever they've done and not done and whether there was betrayal or not and it's, it's, it's all basically based on the same system of light and dark, dark and light, of who belongs to what club. That's basically all it is. So it's nothing personal against me. Anybody behaving or like me would get the same treatment. So I ain't going to cry nobody a river, okay? Because it's not for me to do. I didn't do anything wrong. 
and I did nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, what would you do in my circumstance? I'd like to see, you know, I'd like to see you hardcore worlders out. I'd like to see you survive that. Most people in, in the 2010 <laughs> attempted murder, uh, they wouldn't. Well, the people that all participate in all those things, they're all gone and dead. And here it is five years later, and it's just sad, you know. That's just, that's why I could have no contact with my own family when they were alive. I just wanted to have contact with my mother, but there were people around her that were evil, and that's, and they poisoned me, you know, because they were trying to, you know, either get her money or her house. They wanted to live in her house that they knew she was getting old and going to be dying. And so they were trying to, you know, they had to get rid of me, you know. They're, so there was like a plot. Like, it made total sense. It was like a soap opera. Uh, but I, you know, the Lord said in his word, I would survive even poison. They put, they gave me enough so that nobody could survive that. But I did. Yep. And I didn't even understand it all. I just, I was like, wow, why is this happening? You know, then, then I understand that the people that were involved, they, they ran away because they felt I was going to come back and kill them. Or, there was a whole drama going on there, you know, but it was spiritual warfare 101. The Lord prevailed. And so, you know, the end result is the end result. But yeah, um, the world's a dangerous place. And there's a lot of people sitting in jail and sitting in, you know, loony bins, mental hospitals and stuff, who didn't do anything wrong to anybody. And who are innocent and are in there because they were set up. That too, the Bible says that can happen. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, look, they could bear false witness against you. You know what false witness is. They could, that, that's like framing someone for a crime they didn't commit. And they do this because you belong to Jesus, because you're on that other side. They don't do it to themselves. Well, actually they do, but they're looking for those lambs. It's, it's, a, it's a horrible thing to understand on a very deep level. You know, it's, it's a horrifying thing to understand this is the system that rules the entire world, that affects every single life. That, that people tend to know something about They don't know a lot about it, but they know they're, they're involved in something, they, but they just can't look at it because they're trying to cope with their... They believe in the surface reality of their lives, you know, and the, this other stuff is, to them, very speculative. To me, the surface reality is speculative, and what I'm talking about is the real nitty-gritty hardcore truth, the truth that affects every single life upon the earth. This thing I'm talking about affects every single human being upon the entire earth. Not, you know, you know, the families that rule the world of the Illuminati. And that's why they were fascinated with that film that I did, because they, they felt like it was a key to the families that rule the world, like the Illuminati or whatever. And, and so they're always interested in things like that. But it's, it's deeper than that. The actual viewer of a film like that is also affected within themselves. There's something that resonates and what I talk about here is the very thing that resonates. What I did in that film is the very thing that resonates. That's why I said, you know, if they go to make a sequel, at long last, after so many years, it's, it's just, I wouldn't make a sequel out of that. That was a campy thing. I've, but it, it, it would be a disaster waiting to happen unless they have the essence, unless they have the real thing. It's not just about conspiracy theory. It's not just about... Um, you know, like a they live type of thing. It's not just, it's not about that. It's there's some kind of vibe, almost like this, this spirit that's got to be on it. Or it's, it's, I just wouldn't do it. You know, but I don't know what the status is of it. I don't, I don't really care to look into it. I've, I walked away from all that. And uh, I, for a long time, lived in embarrassment of that film. I was just so embarrassed of how, how awful it turned out. Now they're calling it really, it wasn't awful. It was like done on purpose. It was genius. And I'm like, I was there in the meetings. I was there and it wasn't exactly, they thought, <laughs> it's okay. However they want to spin it, that's fine. But that's not, a, the way they're spinning it isn't exactly what happened. 
If you want the truth about it, you can talk to me. I don't think you get the truth from them, no. These interviewers were just uh, thinking they were on to something, you know, with the interview. And it's like, you guys aren't getting the truth about this thing. <laughs> That's why the weird thing about it is it can never connect to the Zeph report or all bets are off because the Zeph report doubles down, not ashamed at all, but doubling down on it because we know the truth. And, and so, you know, we talk about the truth that people don't talk about. And if people got from that film to the Zeph report, there would be a real problem. So they got to keep that on the, you know, that's, it's got to be like, oh, God, how we deal with that? Well, here's how you deal with it. You could say that Zeph Daniel is, is uh, you know, his own entity and that the earlier person, you know, the other name, there's no connection between the two. And you could do that. Uh, because otherwise it's going to, you know, I mean, and, and I can't even imagine some idiot doing a PhD. That proves that these PhDs are worthless, not worth the paper they're written on. To do any kind of dissertation on this thing is absolute idiocy uh, on the highest order. If you want to do a, a PhD on something, a thesis, then do it on the Zephyr report. Do it on something that has it worked out. But see, you can't do that because they won't allow you to do that in any university because it's all... You know, basically a rigged show. It's all, you know, dissertations are basically propaganda. You're just spouting back what they want to hear. Working in your own little area of expertise that is so compartmentalized, nobody cares anyway. Except in the hallowed halls of academe, which is meaningless ultimately. And, and, and does not move the ball, does not move anything. Whereas the Zeph report does more than a than a pile of PhD worthless uh, degrees. It, it actually moves things. So I'd rather be doing what I'm doing, okay? I found the right thing. I found the way to, you know, I wasn't gonna give up and, you know, I tried films, I tried books, you know, and different things, but I found the way with the podcast to really kind of make everything that I had done and all the works I had done all make sense all makes sense. See, here's the problem. They, they, they don't want anyone to figure out that I, that, I, that I make complete sense and I'm a, a completely lucid, normal human being. Like I say, a law-abiding citizen, not really a rebel at all, and maybe a rebel as an artist. But in terms of being a uh, cogent human being that's grappling with the issues of the day and so forth and doing so in a fairly eloquent and, and uh, reasonable way, you, you can't go, oh, look, this is a crazy man. And he read the screams as crazy. And we had to know, but he was crazy. And then, then we kind of worked it out. And, you know, my genius is really what, you know, there's all this, 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 this. I had to, you know, that wasn't the life for me. That was me, you know, as the prodigal son, working and you know, on someone else's farm in, a, in the pigsty, getting all kinds of crap thrown on me. And, uh, you know, I was like, after a while, you know, you just get sick of it. It's like, you know, okay, I tried to do something beautiful here. I tried to find the truth, and I, I tried to cope with it as best I could. Then I found out from an old writing partner, you know, that they were taking bets on whether how long I would live. So they obviously knew something that they're not admitting. Yeah, they would bet on how long I would live. A lot of them are dead now. They bet how, how long I would live. You know, the, the, the nice film community figuring that, yeah, I'll be, I'll be a... Because a lot of people that are lambs, you know, wind up being, uh, you know, barbecued. I mean, they wind up being, you know, sacrifices in ho-ho wood. It's just the way... I don't know why it's that way. It's, it's just, it's awful. They gobble up souls and lives like, like, like it's McDonald's. And, um, you know, so I, the Lord, you know, moved me out of there, moved me on. Plus, you know, having filmmaking as your God or, you know, like having 
anything be so precious, you know, that, that, that you, you live, you know, or, or, or like your novel and you're living in your characters and they're so important. They're not important. It's a vehicle for you to say something. But as far as it being the thing, God forbids that because it's also incorrect. It cannot do anything. It's a process that's happening. And novels and, and, and you know, music tracks and, uh, you, you know, uh, paintings and things come out of that process. But they in and of themselves are not to be worshipped. But rather seen as a process, you know, something to consider on, on the path, which is fluid, which the world does not and, and will not comprehend, ever. Otherwise, they would not be the world. The world wants permanence. The world wants to build. The world wants everyone to think that this is permanent. We're going to live forever. Of course, that's a lie. You know, we go, we, the world wants us to believe in some kind of, you know, security or social security or some kind of, you know, security and retirement and some kind of life. Those days are over. And that's why, you know, you're going to see suicides, but it can't be you, the lambs. It will be them as they see their world that they created, that they lied for, that they cheated for, that they did harm to innocent ones to, to maintain, they're gonna see it fall around and they're gonna be the victims. You know, and that's, you know, you heard that here first. You cannot, you know, in a glass house, you don't throw rocks. And, you know, this has basically been a house of cards from the beginning. There is no guarantee. We're going to do the best we can. I hope we succeed. I'm just going to put my faith in the Lord that he steers the boat. I'm still a capitalist. I still believe in free markets. I believe in, in fair trade. I believe in, uh, you know, and uh, there's people out there doing really great with investments and with, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, with uh, inventions that are things you can invest in and, and, you know, I see people planning for the future. That's always a good sign. And yeah, using their creativity. And I love that. I, I love seeing that. I don't want to, you know, I, I certainly won't be the one that stops anyone. And, and, and more power to these people. If they want to go make their movies and make sequels to one, something I might have been involved in, great. I hold no grudge, you know. Just I, I have to go through my own incidents and traumas to clear them. And, 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 I'm, and I'm good, you know. The healing that I have is I am not ashamed. less and less ashamed of these Zeph reports. I think I do them as, a, as another therapy, you know. Like, well, you put yourself out there. And it's like, no, I put the truth out there. I use myself as anecdotal evidence for that truth, but that's about it. I, I'm not putting myself anywhere. It's not me versus the world. It's not me versus them. They may be against God and they may be against me, but it's not me back versing them. I'm not against them. I have no enemies. Everyone really loves me anyway. They know that I'm, I'm, I want the best for them. Like I'm thinking about this director. I want the best for him. I enjoyed our time together and I've, I've got no ill will. I don't, you know, if, you know, if making movies makes him happy, well then hopefully he'll make a ton of them before he kicks the bucket, you know, but I just, you know, but, but no one's happy, you know, everybody is grappling for something and no one's happy. And, and it's just like, everybody is hustling up and it's harder and harder to hustle, you know? So we're going to have people dropping through the cracks of society. Okay. Our society is very, very damaged. That's why I think there's interest in a movie called society because it's damaged. It's, it's, it's a movie about the system. It's, it's, it's allegorical at best, and that's all it ever was. Well, they can make anything out of it they like, you know. They can, they can, they can say whatever they want. I want to tell you people, you know, who have a thin skin, the one thing you've got to do out there is um, in, in third world countries, a lot of people that paint their cars, you know, you see it in India and you see it in um, like the Caribbean, and you see down in Africa, and you know, some places, you know, they paint the cars, you know, that even if they're taxis, they paint things on them. Well, in the Caribbean, there's one saying they, they like to paint on their cars, and that's, let them say, okay? Let them say. And, and in that statement, 
you have a lot of wisdom. You know, it's it's like a, a street wisdom, but it's really th the way you have to be. You can't let what they say about you. You know, even like I read, I read, you know, about me being mentioned. You know, and 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 being thought of in a way that just I don't believe is true. But I don't. I I'm going to let them have their say. <clears throat> I don't need to go correct the record. I got nothing to do with it. I'm my life is rolling on. And people say that about me. You know, like I was talking to Mike Horsey, and we'll be talking to him in a few. You know. Uh, uh, and he says, "Well, a lot of people say Zeph is really out there. I can't understand what he's talking about." Blah blah blah. And then, and then, and it's like you know, I say to Mike, I say, "Well, let them say. You know, they always say that. They used to say that in Hollywood. Hey, it's, you know, it's, he's really gifted, but he's really crazy if you can really put up with being around them." And um, it's okay because see, on the Zeph report, I'm the captain of my own ship. You know what I mean? I, the only way I get fired from here is if I fire myself. I think I, I like that uh, arrangement very much. The thing that I have to do is have integrity before the Lord. That's why a lot of these podcasts do not get published. They're like more for me. Or they have errors in them that, I, that the Lord will catch and then I would later say thank you, you know. Or they're dated or whatever. Yes, you'll be in your cubicles and they will be manifesting against you and they will be bearing false witness against you and all these things are going to be happening now, popping off the charts. So just be warned and be ready because we're in that season right now. It's just a lousy 2016. It's off to a horrible start and people are just in the spirit. It's just nasty vibes everywhere you look. So just be, you know, forewarned. You know, you have a double double helping of, uh, you know, of of uh, girding up prayers. You know, get into that Ephesians six. Get into, uh, you know, get into Psalm twenty three. Get into Psalm ninety one. Get just just get really just so keen on it because it's and 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 you know, there's also lots of other verses and lots of other books, even the more obscure prophets and like in Micah and in these other ones. You've got. All kinds of, you know, throughout you have, that's why I have this, um, this book I found in the Bible Promises, which doesn't editorialize. It just lists the scriptures under each topic. And um, I, I don't have it right with me right now. I, I used to have it by the, I had it. And then I'm not sure exactly where I went. It was by my bed. And I was reading through it, and it's it's just really great at dialing in, you know. But there's a lot of scriptures pertaining to each topic, each category. So if you have protection, uh, you know, sickness, um, you know, lots of things where you could just get seriously dialed in. You know, I remember I, I read scripture up in Alaska when I was deathly ill with this kind of fake flu that was going around. I didn't know what it was. I mean... I wasn't the only one that had it. Uh, other people had it too. And friends of mine had it, and it lasted like two months. It was just bizarre, you know. But uh, when it was, I, it was worst, I was, I read, uh, I think I was reading in Thessalonians, and I, I, I just got the Gideon's Bible out of the drawer in the hotel I was in. Bingo. You know, the beginning of my healing started right there. And I was telling the Lord, I said, Lord, if you want to take me, you know, I thought I was going to die there too. And I thought, Go ahead, you know. A lot of people did get taken by that, by the way. A lot of people did die. But I survived it, once again. And um, it was really the scripture that turned things around. So I'm a huge believer in, 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 and I can't tell you the scriptures I looked at. They were not necessarily healing scriptures pertaining to my own situation, but it just triggered that where I was reading triggered that healing. It was just like God triggered right out of the book. So the Bible's crucial, and, and for understanding the way this world is, the way it works. And that's why they're always trying to poo-poo it and say it's inaccurate and, and uh, you know, in terms of uh, whatever and, you know, um, calling Jesus a myth and everything else. is because the name Jesus, when you pray in that name, I mean, th mountains move. The only people that have gotten out of the whole abduction thing, which is basically demonic, uh, generational demonic um, harassment, and hybridization, you know, to a certain degree. But the people that get that kind of harassment are, um, have all, when they, when they totally came into the Lord and they started using that, you know, the name Jesus, 
the whole abductee thing goes away. Same thing with gang stalking, you know, same thing with all of it. It just gets put into a different category. I mean, it may flare up from time to time. It's not like it was, though. I can't tell them that. The, the, the TIs out there, because why? Because they believe it's mechanical, and they're going to keep looking for the perps. And they have handlers online that make sure that you just look for the perps. You know, that's, that's their job is to keep you in this very narrow, kind of myopic, you know, mission of finding out who's operating the satellites and who, what about the electronic trucks and drones and all, you know, and they keep chasing that around like a, like a dog chasing its tail, getting nowhere. And they get nowhere. They don't get relief. That's why I, where I come in, I'm offering relief. You go the way of the Lord, you get relief. You're going to get results. You pray in Jesus' name, you damn, damn right that, 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 that a lot of that stuff's going to fall away. You just give yourself to the Lord and, you know, let the, let, let, let's see what the rest of it happens. As far as me, I mean, I used to have this stuff all the time. Now, does it mean that people don't, you know, make noises and whistle and things? Like I, I described something the other day. I was at Trader Joe's, and there was a guy behind me whistling. No, he wasn't whistling the whole time. I, I saw him in there. He was getting, I looked like he was a restaurant owner, getting alcohol, getting beer mainly, you know, lots of it, you know. But you can tell there's commercial people come in every once in a while. And so he was kind of a cool guy, a little older than me. And then when he was in the line, he was kind of staring at me, and then he'd whistle, and I'd look over at him, and he'd start whistling, you know, and it's like, okay. So I was like, all right, I understand. And um, so I had to, this vision, I don't know, I might have told you this on a podcast, but then I didn't publish it. Okay, but then I had this vision in my mind's eye of just turning around and beating his face in and just punching him out for no reason. <laughs> and I started laughing at my vision. And the next thing you know, the guy was looking paranoid. He stopped whistling. Everything changed because I made a mockery of it, you know, in the spirit. So, you know, there's my big gang stalking uh, incident. What do you think of that? The reason he was whistling is because he could see who I was, even with my back turned. All right? And the, you know, the thing in him could recognize the thing, thing in me, whether I look at him, whether I'm sideways, whether I'm backwards, whether I'm upside down. <laughs> Spiritual Warfare 101, baby. You know, you, you should expect that sort of thing happens out there. No, there's nothing wrong with the whistle, but the whistle particularly bugs me because of having been through a lot of it in the past and, and been through kind of traumas, you know, just things with that whistle, you know, that uh, it's almost like a signal that if we're watching you, you know what I mean? So it, it has more significance. So it's like, you know, so he started down that path and he got quickly upended and it looked like, as I was leaving, he looked like a, a a deer in the headlights, you know, just just freaked, you know, it was just really weird. But uh, they can try that crap. I mean, you know, it, to me, it's like I just want to, you know, basically um, get in their face and say, you know, nice try, um, you know, tell 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 your master I said hello. Remember Jonathan Clack? That's what he would do. He'd, he'd go up to, to the guy. He caused the guy to manifest. The guy who was there wasn't even there anymore. The demon starts talking right out of this guy. And he goes, tell your boss I said hello, making like the, the uh, Illuminati triangle sign with his eye. <laughs> he had some balls. Yeah, that was, that was cool. I, I enjoyed uh, his uh, company and his, uh, his spirit, you know, his fighting spirit. I know it's, I've kind of lost contact with, with, with everybody, you know. But just the Lord has me in a kind of a more sequestered thing. I've been... Mainly just, you know, I mean, we'll be talking to Mike Corsi today, and hopefully we'll be doing a uh, Z and Frankie tomorrow. And um, and then I'm I'm looking for people to interview about things. I was going to do a screencast today. Uh, shoot, you know, I just haven't gotten around. I, I signed up for the screencast software, and, you know, that's where you can, you know, you can lay out your presentation, and it captures what's on your screen, but you can talk and explain what you're talking about and show people the evidence of what you're looking at. I wanted to look at Obama's fake crocodile tear and the stuff he rubbed under his eye 
That's like a Hollywood thing, that stuff you rub under your eye. I know I've been around that a lot. And uh, there's eye drops that cause you to tear, and then there's stuff you rub under your eye that causes you to tear. And that's what he had. But, and it's, it's proven by the pictures. So I was thinking, okay, I'll just focus it on that crocodile tear. Because it was just so blatant, because he's such a bad actor. I mean, I, it, nobody in their right mind would believe, but everyone reported like it was real. And so I'm living in a bizarre universe, you know. I mean, I, I don't even look for conspiracies. I see them. You know, most of the time, if Obama's on the tube, uh, like, say, in the kitchen, there's a little screen in there, and I, I usually just, I just mute it. I don't want to hear his voice. I don't want, to, I don't want anything to do with him. You know, the, the idea that there's a criminal involved in my destiny, being a citizen of the United States, I, you know, someone that lies, like, you know, 85% of the time that he talks, I, I, I have no interest in. Uh, conversely, when Trump is talking, because he just says whatever's on his mind, very refreshing. I dig that. I'm happy. It's a bit like a miracle of God that he's out there with all the opposition against him that he just keeps on and going. I just think that's, that's beautiful. I just I love it. But people tell me you know, he's dangerous and he's bad. And he's, really, uh, he's really down with the whole program of the New World Order and he's going he's gonna to get the presidency and then he's going to turn around and betray it. I'm like, hey, you know, we already had Congress betray us completely. We had Obamacare rammed through. I mean, you know, we've had this gun grab thing going on, which is a pretext to, you know, the knock on the door. And, and said they know what they're doing. And, and so we've had nothing but betrayal. How is this Donald Trump going to be the ultimate betrayal? You're wrong there. You know, I've, my heart's been broken by these, these lousy, awful people in Congress and these awful people in the presidency. And it's been, you know, we've had two sort of globalist, neocon-type presidents right in a row. Now here we are in the same global debt crisis we had back in 2008. So I'm just, I'm looking at that, and I'm looking like, yeah. You know, that's not going to make Obama too popular. He was, the main thing that people gave him a pass on is because he, he solved the economy. You know what I mean? And he'd go around saying, I solved the economy, while keeping 1% growth, basically no growth and half the people unemployed, claiming 5% unemployment. Amazing. He had his cake and his eaten in two. He's destroyed the United States economy while touting his success with it. Well, now the chickens are coming home to roost, and, and he's looked at as a complete economic failure. So that will lead to impeachment proceedings, in my view. That, that's the last. If, that, if the economy goes, you can look toward pure hatred toward Obama, except for the hardcore wealthy elite leftists, you know, the limousine liberals will always be there. You know, for Hillary, Bill, Obama, you know, whatever, take your garden variety, criminal, whatever they are, psychopath, they'll be there. Because <laughs> that's how they roll. You know, if anything, these independent filmmakers I was around in Hollywood, the problem with them is they were too honest and too earnest. The, the real players out there are, are just like, you know, politicians. They're ruthless, they're Machiavellian, they're, they're, they're corrupt. And uh, that's, how, that's how the whole system rolls in, in entertainment. It's all run by the mob as well. In fact, even that movie, that, that society movie, that was all financed by, they said, Japanese money from these major corporations. But then later I find out, no, that was Japanese mob money. You know, and then they say, no, it was from Mitsubishi. It's like, well, is there a difference? <laughs> so okay so it's corporatocracy money okay fine but it's very weird I was back in the old money laundering days yeah you know you, you, you yeah the idea of the that there's some kind of purity when, when you get up to positions of great power and wealth and corporations and you know that, that, then you find out you know the human trafficking that Govinda and I talk about, and you know that we're we're really working to, you know, through our means to bring public awareness to the fact that there's more slavery on this planet today than there ever has been in the history of the of the world, and that's just a shameful legacy. So yeah, I do bring up a, a fault with society. That's right, society. The funny thing to me is these people that made society; they should be thrilled that they're that they're they're saying something and not trying to water it down into oh it's really about equality i mean that's just like this liberal garbage you know 
It's, it's about the satanic system. Deal with it. And until unless this guy ever gets that through his head, he, he's never, it's like he made a movie that he's never going to see. It's like the people that were involved in it, they never knew what they were involved in. <laughs> and if they want to make a sequel and they don't even know what they're involved in, they better, the only way they're going to get a sequel that, that's going to be worth a damn is if they talk to me and they can't do that because then they'd have to acknowledge that, you know, the Zeph report exists and that, you know, maybe I wasn't crazy. You know, they, it just, it, they can't go there. It's a, it's a weird day, you know. Anyway, and I, I wouldn't, I, you know, I would, I, of course I would love to see a movie that was serious about exposing this whole thing. You know, that would be really something, you know. Even if something like Glass Backwards, which is another allegory, that describes the, the satanic system as a satire. It is, um, that was my most brilliant form uh, literary achievement. It was met with absolute thud. Uh, people, that, the Christians hated it because it was, you know, they said it was demonic or whatever because it had the F word in it. And it had, you know, sex in it. So right there was, you know, written off. And the world, of course, thud because it was like touching on things they don't want touched on that are classified. And uh, so so it, it met with, you know, a thud everywhere it went. So I thought, what's... Well, you know, maybe it'll have a life. And recently a guy found one online that I had signed. And uh, he, he, he showed it to me. I think he showed me a picture of it. And I was like, I hope you understand that you're going to read something very perverse there. That's not like Lamb. That was lifting up the scriptures and the lambs and prophecy and the Lord. You know, it wasn't like that. This is, this is a, a book where the devil pops in, Satan talks to the reader and says, stop reading. Tells you, you the reader, to stop reading and, and to stop sympathizing with the, the character. He's telling you that the character is a liar. And so he's discrediting the character. So it's, it's a, it's a, it was my, my highest and best work. And uh, as all highest and best works deserve, it got thrown right in the trash can. And that's what where highest and best works go. You know, oh, it'll be discovered one day. Oh, I have no doubt, you know, because people are hungry for anything. And, you know, but, but see, to me, that book would make an incredible satirical black comedy horrific movie. You know, I mean, it would be way better than society or any of those other concepts or they live or any of it. You know, especially since you're, you're, you're really going allegory, you're really dealing with the protagonist, and it, it's, it's, it's so not about what it's about. You know what I mean? And that's where the artistry comes in, to be able to do that. And most people, unless you're literary people, you wouldn't understand what that means. But it's really nice if you can, if you can write things about something, and characters are really dedicated to something, but then it's not about that at all. And that then has resonance throughout, um, of truth throughout our society, throughout people. And, you know, eventually they'll have lit classes where they talk about the symbolism and, you know, but, but you don't want to do that on purpose. You're telling a story, then later you find out you've been telling another story. And when that happens, it's just beautiful. That's, that's art. That's literary art. So this does rise to that level, but so far the trash can is the only place that goes. You shouldn't put it in the trash can. It's a collector item. You know, but nobody so far who has read it has ever gotten it. They just kind of embarrassing, you know, they kind of pat me on the head and they sort of, shit, we better just put this off to the side. You know what I mean? And it's kind of like, yeah, you know, let's just forget Z ever did that type of thing. Like it's garbage. It's not garbage. It was highly crafted. Now, there, you know, I don't know if there's any typos in it. I, there's got to be, because I know we proofed it ourselves. I, 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 Lamb, I hired a proofreader. And, you know, that, that kind of form of writing, you know, literary writing, novel writing, poetry writing, that kind of thing, I, I can see that. 
but right now I'm involved in songwriting and lyric writing and songs, and, and uh, my new song is San Bernardino, which is the promised land, don't you know? Well, I don't expect that you'll understand the lyrics. You know, um, you'd have to, you know, but you might. It's got an element of crime to it, violence, uh, a longing for something, a mystery. And uh, I had, um, I sent it to uh, a friend, Gary, the phage guy, the phage, who uh, I've collaborated with on, on projects, and then he added some guitar to it that gave it a, you know, that really kind of brought it up in terms of, um, you know, so that, I, that inspired me to work on it some more. And, you know, I, I, it all began where I was, you know, it's funny. I, actually, I need to talk about the music process because that's what's going on. I had learned the chords to uh, Led Zeppelin's Immigrant Song just because I was curious about the chords. And I thought there's a really powerful change between there's an F sharp and then it goes down to the E. You know, there's like an F sharp kind of like F sharp octave thing going on. And then um, you know, it's like you could play an octave. That next chord is that E. It, it's a very powerful change from that F sharp, which you could play as a chord, but they're playing an octave there. They're playing a... Um, they're playing F sharp and then an F sharp octave. So it's dun, 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 it's F sharp octave, F sharp octave, F sharp octave, you know, then down to the open E, right? And then there's some, you know, then, but then I, you know, then I was like, well, I'm not going to do a cover of this. I was just curious, you know, I have a program that shows me the, the chords of any song. So I look at a song that I like, I get the chords and I learn them, you know, and then I started playing with the chords and playing with the concept of the F sharp to the E, which that's a really fast, because I think everyone agrees that Immigrant Song of Led Zeppelin is very powerful, right? It's, it's you know, I mean, Jimmy Page was, a, you know, a genius at, at uh, you know, whether he was a Satanist or not, I'm sorry, but he was a genius at, 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 you know, when he was on, he was on, and he was on on that. And that, that's a song that has endured also. It had been covered by Trent Reznor and lots of other people. So, um, and still around today, you know, being covered, being done. Well, I wasn't interested in doing a cover, I, but I was interested in the power of those chords. But then I deviated. I came up with some kind of variation on C that was going up the scale. It was played not as a bar chord, but up the, the kind of, you know, like a C sharp minor seven type thing. And, you know, it didn't really completely work, but then it did. I can't explain it, and then I kind of deviated from the whole concept, but I, I started off with that, that F-sharp octave, and then down to the uh, open E, and then I went to a different chord than, than they went to. They had a really funny bass line, uh, Led Zeppelin, when it, when it goes up, when it, there's a kind of a going up the scale of chords as it progresses up the octave, you know, they're just bar chords that go up. And uh, the bass line during that are, traditional bass scales. I think they're pentatonic. They're, no, they're not pentatonic. They're like, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. It's like that on the bass line, but it goes, da, 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 very hard thing to play. And so I was like, wow, that's really cool, you know, that that's going on during that walk-up where where plant is singing, you know, oh, it's here, da, 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 da. During that part, the bass line's going, you know, like the do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, do, re, mi, fa, and people don't realize that. Well, I wasn't interested in learning that. I mean, I, I learned the scale. I go, hey, that's the traditional scale right there. That's like you're, you're just, he's just running scales. It's like, yep, the song's not hard to do. All the good songs are really easy like that. They're, but it's, you know, it's the putting them together and it's the working out all the harmonies and all the harmonics and all the, the production. And, you know, there's a lot to it. But, I mean, the, the heart and soul of most songs that you like out there are very simple. Like, you know, Hello from Adele is very simple as three chords. <laughs> you know? So, and it's a classic already. Anyway, I, was, I love going back to that period because I was looking for that vibe, you know, I was trying to get that, you know, that kind of analog vibe, and I was playing through my Fender amp for the Fender Supersonic with a, 
uh, with a, a new speaker and a Celestian speaker that I'm miking that and I'm putting it into the analog channel strip, right, and bringing that into the session. So you're getting, oh, no, it's going through the pedals, you know, and I got the whole wah-wah thing going. And, and then I had, uh, you know, the phage coming in with a... Uh, with his doing like a Boston kind of thing, you know. So it's kind of steeped in that vibe of that time. And then, you know, I, I have the the good drums and, and um, I play a wild bass in it, you know, I'll say that. Like I'm a madman on bass. It's really, he must be crazy. Um, you know, so I'm, so I'm kind of happy with the way it turned out. And then I started doing the vocals and the vocals turned out really good. You know, the lyrics turned out really excellent, you know, top. And it's got everything going for it, including, you know, when you hear it, you'll think, wow, there's lots of changes in there and lots of, you know, yeah, you know, it's like we're doing, but they're not really complicated. They're just like where emotionally, you know, where the hook of the thing, where it needs to go next. And it's only like three minutes, which I'm really proud of that, that it doesn't blather on. And um, so I started, then we listened to Frank Zappa's San Bernardino. He shortens it to San Bernardino, which is a satirical song about, you know, something that's just in the sticks of San Bernardino. That was a joke back in the day in SoCal. His name is Bobby. He looks like a potato. Uh, it's just so good. It's like, you know, I was listening to the, the vocal harmonies and I asked my friend, I said, hey, is that, what kind of effect, how are they doing that? And he goes, those are double tracked. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then put out to the side. So one, one, so one track is on the left, one's on the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I got inspired by that. And I said, okay, I'm going to double track some of this. So yesterday I was double tracking some of the vocals to really, you know, because the vocals are good, on, the lyrics are good, so I want you to, hear them, but I also want you to be enveloped by the music at the same time. So look for it. It's called San Bernardino, Promised Land. And because I've spent everything on this and I'm going to see Horsey pretty soon, obviously you ain't going to get that track from me because, see, you're getting my best right now with this. Don't you want me to focus on music and put out lots of tracks? I mean, do you want me... <laughs> well, this one's coming. I've been working on this, you know. And uh, decided to polish her up, you know, because given all that analog goodness, I put, I put some uh, saturation on there from a uh, uh, hardware circuit that I have, you know, an analog hardware saturation circuit, putting it on the master bus. And it's like, wow, you know, that's it's because I've been going for this, wanting to go back to the 70s. Yeah, you know, I've been like, you know, going back, going back, you know, it, it, it doesn't exactly come out like that, but you do get a vibe. And, you know, what, what I notice about that 70s feeling, that's like all the gear I have is to run it all through all that, you know, to put, to bring me back to analog land, back to those days. It, you know, what it gives me, it just, there's a warmth, there's a, there's a, like you sidle up to the track, you know, you can really blast it too, and it doesn't, that it doesn't digitally out crap out on you, you know? And so it's like, wow, I mean, we, I guess we were fools to get rid of analog, weren't we? I keep going back to the 70s. I told my friend Rob, I mean, I'm back in the 70s. I'm miking my amps and doing it old school, you know? And uh, he goes, take me with you. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we all know the good mixes were coming from back then, just prior to the digital age, which began in 1980. Isn't that amazing? The last good mixes. Well, like a lot of people, I was stupid and getting rid of my vinyl. I mean, I'm a big music lover, you know, so I've just mystified at my own behavior and having been duped into this digital thing. I'm even missing that, my old cassettes. I'm missing tape. I, I miss, you know, I, I, I love this... Um, Thing that we have called the two bus plus it's for anal it's an analog subbing mixer and I have two of them so I have I don't know how many channels that is I can't add it up right now but it's like what is it uh, 112 it's 32 channels of analog summing and but on this thing they have harmonics 
a parallel limiter and a thing and a transformer circuit that just gives you a vibe. And it all takes you back. When you turn these things on a little, you give it just a little bit over the whole mix. And it just brings you back to that era of the 70s. It's hard to, hard to explain. Frank Zappa's San Bernardino, one of the best vocal mixes I've ever heard. And a great drum mix. Not the best bass mix, but I would say everything else is really just amazing. Uh, 1975, right smack dab in the middle. And I'm a big fan of that song. So there's a little bit of uh, inspiration from that. Not, not writing-wise, but... Um, there's like an aside, you know, a, a glance, a feint towards Zappa. And, and he was a Satanist. He, he ran the house in Laurel Canyon. Yes, they were all Satanists. They're all confused. They're all... To me, the Satanists of the world, like when I think back on my friend, you know, the filmmakers, you know, yeah, well, I guess they were Satanists. But, you know, what I I get in the end is they're just confused. They just... They're just kind of hiding in this film thing, trying to find some peace. You know what I mean? And, and they say, well, you put a thing up on Ginger Baker, you know, in the documentary. And I'm like, Ginger Baker, yeah, he was a big influence on me. I used to listen to that Cream drum solo live, Wheels of Fire. And I used to listen to his drum solo. I said, how could you do it? It was brilliant and musical. And, you know, he just had that all day long. And I just wondered how he came up with what he came up with. And then I found it, ladies and gentlemen, I found it. In the interview itself, I realized that there was another guy that influenced him. And unfortunately, he influenced him toward heroin as well. But they would listen to African drumming over and over, the two of them. They were both excellent drummers. And I forget the other guy's name, but it's in the documentary. And that's where his ideas came from, from Africa, from the African drumming. And he actually ended up moving to Africa, uh, to South Africa. Uh, that's where he lives, not in Europe. And um, I found that very interesting. I've, that, that was a key. I've been looking for that. I said, where did he get that idea? Where did he get this idea? It, all of it goes back to, I mean, he also was just, you know, a, a genius in his own right. You know, he just had all his own stuff going on. But he didn't sound like anybody else. I think we could uh, agree with that. I mean, people say, well, Neil Peart and Tom Sawyer, that was, like, really amazing. And, you know, it's, yeah, but it never was that unique compared to, I mean, he's unique. He's great, Neil Peart. But, I mean, it's not better than Ginger Baker. So being a drummer myself, you know, I've, you know, wanted to understand more about the guy. And I thought that other people would, too. I did not expect that I'd be shamed for presenting a known Satanist and such a horrible man as that that beats people up if they don't, if he doesn't like them, throws things at people, you know, just being a jerk half the time or all the time. I'm like, yeah, that wasn't what was fascinating to me, you know, just the man behind the drums and his cantankerous personality obviously contributed to his fierce drumming as well. But he was a flawed man, no question. Or is. Well, I think we've kind of, you know, done it today. So suicide, uh, number one, two, or three, you know, take your pick. Do you guys get it now? The Lord's looking out for you. The holy angels are ministering to you. They're, at your, they're in your bed with you. They're at your bedside, they're helping you. This thing, I can feel it's already passing. I don't mind, to, I'm not mad at you, no. I just want you to understand that the thoughts of suicide right now are not your own. There's a lot of spiritual warfare going on right now. It's really snowing and sleeting right now. Wow. And we have a leak again, where we had it before. But it's really coming down right now. And we've had, every day it rains here. Every day it rains and then it turns to snow. And then we have snow and then it passes and another one comes in. It's El Nino to beat the band here. It's, if you ever want to see New Mexico, I would say that if you are this area of the Southwest and Arizona, New Mexico, etc., 
uh, the summer will probably be utterly beautiful because of how much water there's been. You know, it gets almost, the atmosphere gets almost like magical when you have this magical light because you're so close at 7,000 feet. You're so close, you're, you're up there, but you're still in the desert, you know, so it's, it's very interesting. Well, I feel I'm kind of coming down off it. I just, you know, realized that we covered some pretty heavy stuff, but, you know, I'm just showing I would not be healed in the spirit unless I could forgive everything and everyone and, and even, even volunteer to do it again. If I had to do it again, I wouldn't change a thing, ladies and gentlemen, not one thing. And even if I know there were some very painful moments, but I would still rather go through that than be, you know, than the alternative. So no, no regrets. I have gratitude. Gratitude for the Lord. Gratitude for my song, San Bernardino, The Promised Land, um, and help I had on the collab. And, you know, there was some, some help I had on, on, well, the chords that I was doing were, were fine. I did some really nice wah-wah lead and stuff, but it needed some extra layer, which, you know, we got from the phage, and he did some artwork. He didn't include himself. I said, hey, you know, you can include yourself. I mean, you know, this is, it's not just my, it's, I mean, it's sort of my baby, you know, but, uh, you know, when people make you know, great contributions, they, they, they get credit as far as I'm concerned. I don't need to hog any limelight. <laughs> but yeah, the San Bernardino thing is my, is my baby, and, and I don't know why it turned out to be s such a good, Hook and this you could play this on the radio, you know, and 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 uh, you know it's it's one of those songs that could just be it's it's something that you know it people like it they just it just it's I don't know why it 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 works and then this thing I'm working on now I've got another song that I'm working on that is a satire that's really just kind of nasty and strange, but I love it. it but it's never going to be a hit, you know what I mean? It's not going to make. It, it's 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 weird, you know. I'm I'm moving more into um, songs that you know hook people in, not on purpose. It's really very organic. It's just, you know, I'm 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 dealing a little bit with the. I just associate, for whatever reason, San Bernardino with crime. Not just the uh, terrorist shooting, but I mean with it's just kind of a criminal vibe. I don't know why that is. That whole area of Southern California, it's just associated with a criminal vibe. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, it's, it's desperados, you know, it's about desperados looking for San Bernardino to be a good, a good score, you know? And uh, that's all. Why it wound up that way, I have no idea. I don't know what I'm thinking. I mean, I don't know what I'm doing. And sometimes I realize it later, you know? What I love about music production, and you know, in this, I it's it's on a high level. I mean, we got the drums where every everything is radio ready. We got bass, drums, lots of layers of guitars and vocals. It's all kind of being done the way that you would hear it on the radio. So I love production. It takes you know three minutes of song, it takes a long time when you want to produce it. I mean, I have the tools to do it, but it just it it still it takes time. And you know. I give it away freely. You know, I told my fr friend, I said, I'm holding on to this one. I mean, it's, once I release it, it's like it's gone, you know what I mean? I want to hold on to it for a little bit. You know, the production of it is, you know, the polishing of it, I, I like polishing it. I, I want to make sure that when you hear it, you just get kind of knocked, you know, knock your socks off. Oh, not with shredding metal or anything, just with the, with the, with the song itself. It's, it's, and, you know, the other thing I like is that it's got all that going for it, and in about three minutes and ten, three minutes ten seconds, three minutes fifteen, that was the length of many of the songs back in the seventies, like three minutes ten sec, two two minutes forty eight seconds, three minutes and twenty seconds. You know, it was all around those that time, and I find that very interesting as well. You know how that kind of coincidentally became that. So there's my spiel about that. What I'm going to talk to Mike about is. Uh, spend about half of it on Bible prophecy and the world and how he sees things prophetically. And then I want to spend another half hour on the economy and what he thinks is coming up. I'm sensing, and I'll just, just lay this out straight to you people. I'm sensing a huge, you know, 
rubber band snapshot crazily to the upside of of commodities. I don't know whether it's because of war circumstances or oil refineries being blown up by ISIS or this conflict or the conflict in the Middle East or a wider war elsewhere. But somehow I just see this this kind of like this sort of snapping of of commodities to, to, to going out of sight, to being unaffordable by most people. But right now with with gas at uh buck eighty one, that's what I saw at the pump the other day, buck eighty one, I'm like, okay, in today's dollars that's basically free gas. Anything below two bucks is free. And you'd have to be a fool if you think they're going to give it to you for free for much longer. You know, they've been, they've been giving it to you for free because they're in a war right now to break the back of the frackers and stuff. And so the Saudis have taken a hit as well. But it ain't free. They're, when it snaps, it's going to go beyond where it was. It's going to be, you know, five bucks at the pump. You know, there will be a payback for that. Free, that free time will be paid for by excessive prices later on. So that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing those excessive prices not too far from now, which then means, you know, you have gold that's come back, retreated to like 1100 1200 That's still way higher than when I ever recommended it. You know what I mean? A long time ago in the Zeff report, I had gotten some gold when it was like three fifty, and Everyone was happy with that, but it's gonna, it's gonna, it's been artificially held down. It's that it's gonna fly too. A lot of these things are gonna fly, but it won't be for good reason. It'd just be for because that's the price of it, the real price of these commodities. You know what's silver worth? If uh, well, the silver that when I I remember selling silver at two fifty two dollars fifty three cents. It's fourteen dollars now. I remember buying it at three fifty. Three dollars fifty cents the ounce. It's still fourteen, but it had been as high, according to Mike. It had been at, it had been at forty eight dollars the ounce. Well, I know for a fact that that's really the the price it should be right now, but I just sense this instability of the world, and that suddenly these commodity prices just, all of a sudden they just start skyrocketing for no reason. Nobody knows why it's happening, and it might even be phenomenal in a way that some some. Th- something economists are arguing about. They're wondering, what the hell is going on? Is there something we don't know? It's like, yeah, there's... It's war, man. And in war, commodities soar. With that, I bid you...